and rapid firing and hyperactivity dynamics. Um, I'm presenting this because I think it's a it's something that I've been working a lot on, but I think it also kind of matches the theme of multi-scale biology and we're gonna break it that down to how it's all connected. So understand what I'll be talking about first. I need to give some background on membrane and lipid biology. Um, so lipids make up membranes and membranes make up all the cells that we have, um, living organisms. Um, membranes are very dynamic with a lot of different biophysical properties that enable different biological functions. So for example, you need a membrane to be able to be bendable to undergo a process like membrane fission and fusion where you're essentially bending membranes or ripping them apart. Membranes have different thicknesses. This is important for protein interaction. So there's a lot of transmembrane proteins that localize, they can localize to membranes of different thicknesses. Um, membranes have different fluidities. So there's more rigid membranes. So for example, the plasma membrane is very rigid because it's supposed to be like a barrier for the cell to make it impermeable. However, there's other membranes that are much more fluid and permeable, and that helps things get through for transport. Um, and then finally, something that people don't really think too much about is membranes also come in very different phases. So what's normally known is that membrane, the membranes that make up our cells are bilayers, so they're in flat sheets. However, there's other membrane phases that are, well, the flat sheets are called lamellar, and there's other phases that are called non-lamellar, where you don't have sheets anymore, Essentially, what you have is kind of what you see here on this <clears throat> lower panel where they're not flat sheet, they're kind of either in tubes or inverted in some way. And you need these phases are very important as intermediates for processes like fission and fusion. So for a cell to divide or a membrane to come together, you kind of have to force lipids into inverted orientations to actually get the membranes to come together. Um, and so all of these membrane process, like or biological processes are dependent on all of these biophysical properties. Um, the cell is optimized to maintain them, to preserve optimized biological function, like fission, fusion, um, transport, what else? Uh, I guess protection through permeability. Um, <clears throat> and so cells have to be able to maintain these properties um, so they're not disrupted and so cells can keep functioning. Going deeper, so that was kind of higher level. If we go deeper, all the membranes are made up of lipids. Um, and lipids, there's thousands of different species of them. Um, there's kind of three different parts that can each can be recombined to make a different lipid species. So you have a chemical head group that's kind of sticking out of the membrane that's what's on the water side. Um, inside the actual bilayer, you have the tails. <clears throat> so those are hydrophobic. And then connecting the tail and the head, there's something called uh, linkage. Most lipids that we have are phospholipids and they're ester phospholipids. So they have this uh, ester bond that links the tail and the head group. However, there's another lipid class that I'll be talking about that's instead of being connected by an ester group, it's connected by an ether group. Um, and these lipids are called plasmalogens. Um, not too much is known about them, but they are very enriched in the brain and heart. They can make up up to 60% of the lipids and fats in your brain. And not the thing that people kind of know most about them right now and think, or what they believe they're responsible for and what the roles are in cell is that this ether linkage acts as kind of a decoy for um, radical oxygen species. So any radical oxygen species will come and kind of degrade this lipid first and it'll kind of save the actual structural phospholipids with ester links kind of intact. Um, but we're kind of starting to think of it as more of a biophysical element that helps give membranes different biophysical functions instead of just as, acting as this like oxidative decoy. Um, so I'll be going into that later. Uh -huh. <clears throat> so Something to point out here that's important to know is that lipids based on, so they can have different head groups and different tails and based off of the size of the head groups and size of the tails, this gives lipids different geometrical structures. Um, so, you know, you imagine a lipid that has a head group that has the same area as the area that its tails take up, its whole geometric shape is gonna be a cylinder. 
Um, and then when you take all these cylindrical lipids and you stack them together, they're going to form a flat sheet. However, so kind of what's shown here, and you, you see this flat sheet lamellar phase. However, if you have a head group that's smaller or bigger than the area that the tails take up, <clears throat> those are not going to stack up very flatly. They're going to essentially stack up in a way where they're curved and form curvature in the membranes. And you have, if you have enough of these lipids stacked together, they'll start forming these non lamellar phases that are inverted. Um, so you need a different com you need a combination of all of these lipids in your membranes to give this membranes different biophysical structure, <clears throat> different biophysical properties. Um, you need a mixture of them to give the membranes different capacities of bending or taking on different shapes. Um, within the tails, there can be different levels of unsaturation and length. And so the more double bonds or unsaturation you have in your lipid tails, the more fluid the membrane is going to be, the more permeable it's going to be, and the better, easier it's going to bend. Um, and thickness is also something that is based on the length of the tails. Um, I'll be talking a lot for, first then I'll be talking about this technique called small angle x-ray scattering. Um, and it's a biophysical, it's a physical uh, technique that we've been using um, to understand the phases that lipids, that lipid membranes form. Um, so essentially what this is, what SACS is, is that you have, you bring in a sample that has lipids in it. Um, it's going to be a very concentrated sample. So essentially, if you imagine you have a sample with member with lipids that form this lamellar phase, you're going to have all these sheets stacked on top of each other like very tightly. Um, with SACS, you should not x-ray through that, and based off of the phases and organization of the lipids in the sample, they're going to diffract at different angles. And based off those diffraction patterns, you can essentially tease apart and figure out what phase the lipids are in. <clears throat> um, and we can use this technique to essentially study um, what phases lipids form, and it's a very small changes within the lipid structure can result in very different phases of the lipid. So essentially there's this PC lipid. So that's one of those cylindrical ones that I was talking about. So the cylindrical lipids form these flat sheets and it's gonna cause this very regular even distribution of peaks of the scattering patterns. So this makes sense because all your lipids are very uniformly distributed and they're gonna form, <clears throat> their diffraction patterns are gonna be very uniform. However, the non lamellar phases, which are essentially these tubes um, that are kind of like all stacked together, these have a more complicated diffraction pattern. So it's not going to form this even spacing of peaks um, from your X ray scattering. It's going to form a different pattern. <clears throat> and the only difference between these two lipids is that this PC cylindrical lipid has three methyl groups sticking off of its head. Whereas this conical lipid called PD, um, <clears throat> it just it doesn't have those three methyl groups. So its head is smaller. And so that if you imagine like a small head and these two lipid tails kind of sticking out, it's going to probably make a cylinder. Um, whereas the PC has equal head and tails, so it causes the um, cylindrical shape. <clears throat> um, so I'll be talking about this in the context of pressure. So the I guess people came in later, so I'll um, bring up. Sorry, one second. So I started this off by saying this was a collaboration between myself and or my lab and marine biologists from the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. Um, there they're understanding, they're studying how um, comb jellies adapt to very extreme environments like deep ocean where there's a lot of pressure. Um, and so my part of this is understanding how lipids can be used to adapt to those high pressure environments and preserve membrane function. Um, so under pressure, what happens is if you have this conical lipid, pressure is gonna try to compress that and reduce volume. So this also compresses the geometric shape of the lipid. So it becomes, kind of, it's not a compound anymore, it's gonna constrain it more into a cylinder. <clears throat> so now if you imagine you have a membrane that you know, at just surface pressure, you have all these conical lipids in it, and then you bring it under, two kilometers deep under the ocean, all those conical lipids are gonna be compressed into cones. And all of a sudden your membrane is gonna be made up of all of these 
cylindric lipids <clears throat> that are going to be forming lamellar phase, and you're kind of trapped. You're not going to be able to form all those other phases, or your membranes aren't going to be able to bend as much or be as dynamic anymore because the lipid shapes are much more constrained. Um, as you can imagine, pressure is also going to compress the actual lipid packing itself, so that also disrupts a lot of membrane properties like permeability. Um, and so in order to preserve biological functions, cells will probably need to kind of tune what sorts of lipids they're making in order to adapt biophysical membrane properties to a new environment. Um, so that's essentially my focus of my work is more biochemistry of understanding cells um, and cell membranes and how they can tune their lipid lipid synthesis in order to accommodate um, different environmental conditions. Um, <clears throat> so some examples of this are if you have a membrane you put under pressure, you can imagine that at surface pressure, it's pretty fluid, but you put it deep down in the ocean where there's a lot of pressure, all your lipids are gonna be compressed. It's not gonna be as fluid anymore. So one way to counteract that is by making lipids that have more unsaturations. If you make lipids that are more in saturations, you're including you're increasing the fluidity of the membrane. Um, similarly, I talked about the change in the shape of the lipids. Um, <clears throat> they can just make other lipids that are kind of more curved and have higher curvature. <clears throat> but we don't really know if cells are capable of sensing this and dynamically uh, adapting to it if they sense a change. <clears throat> Um, in order to study this, this is essentially kind of the pipeline that we've been following. So we have our collaborators at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Um, they go out on research expeditions. They've been collecting all these animals and doing all different omics analyses on them, transcriptomics, lipidomics, proteomics, to understand are there biomarkers of adaptation to extreme environments. Um, <clears throat> the biomarkers that they do identify, I then take those and I introduce them um, into model microorganisms like yeast and uh, bacteria, E. coli. Um, so as one example is this. So if, you, you know, if they detect one lipid that's enriched in animals that are in the deep ocean, I can then go and find some sort of pathway to make those, put them into yeast. Um, I grow the yeast under pressure. So we have these titanium chambers that we can pressurize and grow cultures in, in the incubator. Um, take them out, and then I can see if just the introduction of this one new lipid species is helping the yeast survive under pressure. Um, and if it does, then we can go even deeper with that and kind of study why is the lipid helping organisms and cells survive under pressure. Um, <clears throat> and this takes you kind of into very fundamental biochemistry and biophysics that can then be reapplied to disease and health and understanding membranes in general. <clears throat> So I'll start off by kind of introducing the data that's already been analyzed and collected from the marine biologists. Most of this work, or most of the comb jelly work was done by Jacob Winnikoff. Um, he was a grad student at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute in UC Santa Cruz. He's now a postdoc at Harvard, um, but we're still finishing this up and working on it at the time. What he did is, well, they collected around 120 of these animals. Um, across the world, Antarctica, Hawaii, different places that have very different depths and temperatures of water. Um, they did a bunch of analyses. In my case, we only really care about the lipidomics, so how the lipid profiles of the animals changed over these conditions. Uh, <clears throat> and so they've identified a few features that they believe are helping the palm jelly survive under different temperatures and uh, pressures for the ocean. Um, one thing that, I guess the most, the easiest thing that people usually think of and understand is fluidity. Um, so what they did learn is that the comb jellies that are deep down in the ocean, they do have more lipids that have more unsaturations in the tail. So that is one property that we're finding is that at one adaptation to pressure is making more unsaturations to make the membranes more fluid. Um, in terms of the changes in the head groups that they've noticed, those are a little more complicated. Um, and I'll break those down later. But two of the key findings that they found was one, there's this enrichment of a certain 
with the class. So the plasmalogens that I introduced. Um, <clears throat> and also different ratios of these cylindrical to conical lipids are also seen. Um, in my work, so like I said, I introduced them, their findings and I, I try to put them into my model microorganisms like yeast and coli, um, <clears throat> just to introduce the strains of yeast that I've been using. Uh, one is just Saccharomyces because it's standard, and the other one is this other yeast called Lachantia clavari. Um, and I use them as comparisons specifically for studying um, tail and saturations because Saccharomyces is only able to produce lipids that have either no unsaturations or one unsaturation in their tail. However, the other yeast strain called Lachantia clavari, it's able to introduce even more unsaturations in their tails. So we were thinking if this Wachantia clavari is able to produce more unsaturated membranes and more fluid membranes. Um, if we grow those under pressure, will they actually you know, be enriched and become start producing more of these unsaturated ones? And will they survive better than Saccharomyces because they're able to produce more unsaturated ones? Mm -hmm. Yes. One last thing is, so mm -hmm. for the Wachantia clavari, we've generated mutant strains where we've essentially knocked out these genes that are responsible for introducing those extra saturations. So we have strains of Wachantia clavari that are able to produce just one double bond, two double bonds, or three double bonds. Um, so this kind of also gives a deeper insight or more variability in the experiments that we can do. Um, <clears throat> So I, essentially, this is that Wachantia clavari. These are the strains where I have a FAB3 knockout. So the FAB3 knockout is the FAB3 gene knocked out. So it can't make this 18-3. It can't make any tails that have three unsaturations in it. It can only make tails that have up to two. Similarly, we have the FAB2 knockout that can only make um, lipids that have a single unsaturation in it. And the FAB2 knockout is essentially equivalent to Saccharomyces because they can only make lipid tails that have zero or one in saturation in them. Um, and so when I take all of these strains and I grow them under pressure to compare um, how well they grow, um, what we see here is that the strain, so in green is this, the fat to knockout, that's the strain that can only make zero or one double bonds in its tail. Essentially that one cannot grow under pressure at all. But the wild type strain that can make unsaturation, all three unsaturations in their tails, that strain is able to grow the most. And so what we're seeing here is we think that the ability to fluidize the membrane and produce these polyunsaturated fatty acids is one way that cells can adapt to high pressure and preserve their growth and preserve the fluidity of the membrane. Um, <clears throat> so this is looking at the lipidomics of so the actual lipid profiles of the tails. So here what I have is I grew these strains under just room pressure and high pressure at 250 bar. Um, that's equivalent to the water pressure under two kilometers, two and a half kilometers under the ocean. Um, and we ran with the domics on both the strains that were grown at room, room pressure and deep pressure to see what types of lipids are they making the two conditions. Um, uh, so, so this left panel is W303 Saccharomyces and FM628 is the Lachantia clavari. Um, we just starting off looking at uh, <clears throat> Saccharomyces. And the pink is everything that was grown at just room pressure. And the blue is everything that was grown at the uh, high pressure. And what we see here is that between room pressure and high pressure, the yeast start making more of these lipids that have a single double bond. Um, but they also, decrease their production of lipids that have two double bonds. Um, and I think what's going on here is, so if you think about the strain, I was said Saccharomyces can only make lipid tails that have zero or one double bonds. So what these lipids here are that have a total double bond number of two is that they just have one double bond on both tails. And there's a decrease in that. And I think what's going on here is that they're kind of remodeling their lipids so that they instead of having one double bond on each tail, they're kind of just distributing that double bond to other lipids that only have it on a single tail. So you're kind of distributing the saturation to a higher area of more lipids instead of just 
having single lipid species that have two double bonds. Um, we see a similar trend in <clears throat> the Lachantia clavari yeast. Um, here we also see that, uh, well, it's kind of interesting that the Fab2 knockout, which is supposed to be equivalent to Saccharomyces, kind of does the opposite, where it decreases all the lipids that just have a single double bond. Instead, it increases all the lipids that have two double bonds on them. However, the wild type that's able to make tails with all three unsaturated tails, here they definitely take advantage of that. You can see that under pressure, they start making a lot more of these lipids that have three double bonds, four double bonds on the tails. Um, so the ability to produce these unsaturations on the tails is something that yeast seem to be accessing to, to preserve their membrane and cellular structure. Mm -hmm. um, I talked briefly about how can cells be able to like sense this. Um, one example is, or something that's known is one, there's a membrane fluidity sensor called MJ2. Um, it's parallel with SPT23. So it's a transmembrane protein that has these two transmembrane QECs and the membrane core. Um, it's got these kind of in the middle of the membrane core. It has two tryptophans that in a, in a very fluid and like lightly packed membrane, the tryptophans are facing away from each other. However, when your membrane becomes much more compressed, the tryptophans flip over and stack on top of each other. And this induces this large structural change within the protein that leads to its proteolysis and eventually downstream it upregulates the production of unsaturated lipids. So essentially when membrane <clears throat> when membranes become stiffer and more compressed, this is activated to increase the synthesis of unsaturated lipids. So this is one example of a sensor. Um, it's been shown to be active in the cold. So we know it's response to cold, but no one knows it can also act as a pressure sensor. Essentially, you're kind of reproducing the same effect. Cold and high pressure, you're compressing membranes or making them more fluid or less fluid. Um, so that's kind of the next step in this experiment. Something that I'd like to test is to see if this protein does also become activated under pressure conditions. Um, so that wraps up kind of the adaptations and changes in the tail of the lipids. Um, for the rest of the talk, I'll be talking, focusing on the changes in the head groups and linkage or the ester ether linkages of the lipids. Um, <clears throat> so there's a lot of different lipids with a lot of different head groups. Um, for the talk, I'll just be focusing on PE and PC. So phosphatidylethanolamine, phosphatidylcholine. Phosphatidylcholine is that uh, cylindrical lipid that forms flat sheets. Phosphatidylethanolamine is a conical lipid that forms these curved membranes or inverted membranes that are tubes. Um, but when you mix them together, you put these conical and cylindrical lipid together, you just get a very dynamic and fluid membrane that's able to undergo different conformational changes. Um, <clears throat> from, yeah. What I have here is the lipidomics and class distribution of these different lipids, both at room pressure and high pressure. Um, and so for the first segment, I'll be talking just about the ratio of these PC to P lipids. So it's known that you kind of you need to have a very you need to maintain a careful balance of PC lipids to the P lipids, so conical lipids to cylindrical lipids, because you need to be able to preserve membrane, letting the membrane take on different shapes and sizes. <clears throat> you can imagine that mem membranes are compressed, and I said the conical lipids are also compressed into more cylinders. Um, one adaptation for that is just to make more of these conical lipids to counteract that, uh, to preserve, or to stop the membranes from just going being trapped in flat sheets. Uh, and that is something that we observe here. So between low pressure and high pressure, we'd see both reductions in PC, so less of the cylindrical lipids, and a production, uh, increased production of the P. Um, and that was also seen in the palm jelly tina pores. Um, but I, what I wanted to do is I wanted to actually titrate and vary these PCP ratios to see how they affect increased growth under pressure. Um, so we can either like, I've metabolically engineer the yeast by 
introducing knockouts into their lipid synthesis pathways um, to kind of constrain them into just making a certain type of lipid or making less of the cylindrical lipid and more of the conical lipids. Um, and so here what I have is if you knock out this gene called PSD1, it will make less of PE, so less of the conical lipids. Um, the, there's another gene in this pathway called PEM2, and that's in the synthesis of the cylindrical lipids, PC. Um, so I have strains of these where I've knocked both of those out. Um, and what I have here is kind of reflecting the ratios of those knockouts. So your PEM2 knockout that has very low PC, this is going to be very enriched in PE. Um, what's interesting here is that PC is it's a very large component of just all of the memories that make up your cells. But even if you delete it or knock it down by 15 fold, 15 times down, the cells are still phenotypically the same as phylotype. Um, and the same thing is observed when you grow them under pressure. So that's shown here in the cell, second column or second bar, that's this darker blue. Um, how long bar pressure it grows similarly to wild type. And then when you grow it, that strain also under high pressure, it's also pretty, there isn't much of a defect in growth under high pressure. So getting rid of or decreasing the cylindrical lipids dramatically doesn't really seem to affect the growth of the yeast under pressure. However, if you get rid of or decrease the production of the conical lipids that you need to form these you know, curved membranes or tubular membranes or you need, yeah, you need these lipids to essentially allow membranes to go through fission and fusion processes. Um, when you knock down the level of PE in the cell, um, the yeasts are pretty much no longer able to survive. So this is the last bar on this plot. Um, it's still, still able to grow fine at room temperature, room pressure. However, under high pressure, um, the yeast just die. So it seems like the ability to make these conical lipids is vital or important to growth and survival under pressure, high pressure environments. We're trying to understand why. Um, <clears throat> and the, the main idea we, we have is that we think that you really need these conical lipids to let the cell, to allow the cells to go through fission fusion processes. And if you don't have those anymore, then the cells they're pretty much just stuck. They can't divide anymore. Um, their organelles can't divide or do anything. Uh, so if you don't have the conical lipids, all your membranes are kind of just trapped in fat sheets. So that's kind of talking about the PCP lipids. Um, the last part of the talk, I'll be focusing on these plasmalogens. So as I mentioned before, <clears throat> um, these are a separate lipid class from you know, the most common phospholipids that we have, but the only difference is that they have the plasmalogens have this vinyl ether linkage that connects the head group and the tails, um, whereas gen the most common phospholipids we have are connected by this ester linkage. Um, plasmalogens make up 40 to 60 percent of lipids in the brain. Um, I wouldn't really say that people understand why that is, but that is a question that we are interested in understanding. And so, why are we focusing on these plasmalogens? It's because that um, our marine biologist collaborators noticed that there's very high enrichment of them in the comb jellies that came from very deep environments, um, which is strange because generally the slipid does in non-brains, non-complex organs, they don't really make too much. They only make up maybe like 10 to 15% of the membranes. However, in these animals, we're finding that they're making up more kind of closer to the composition of the brain, where it's like 40 to 60% of them, <clears throat> of the lipids in these animals are generally these plasmalogens at high pressures. Um, to understand what's going on here, we started, we've been using this technique called tax that I talked about before. Essentially what we've been doing is we've been taking the animals that they have, um, extracting all the lipids that are in them, and putting them into a small sample, shooting x-rays at them, and trying to see what sorts of phases are the lipids, what sorts of phases are the membranes of these animals in at varying pressures. Um, so we do 
SACS at Cornell. They have a, a high energy synchrotron source, which is what you use to do SACS because you're shooting X-rays at the samples. Um, what's special about this facility at Cornell is that their sample chamber is pressurizable. So we can essentially sweep different pressures across the sample and see how the lipid phases change across different pressures. And what membranes are the lipids gonna form when the animals are at high pressure versus low pressure. And what we see, so here, this is a comparison of just, I'll go back. So it's just a comparison of PE that has an ester bond in it versus the plasmalogen form of it, which just has this ether bond. So the only difference between the samples that we're comparing are the ester and ether bonds. <clears throat> and what we see between these are, so the PE, so the one that just has the ester bond across all pressures, it's kind of just stuck in flat sheets. However, the plasmalogen version of it that has the ester the ether bonds, it's able to access a variety of these different phases. So it's able to go into both these inverted phases that you need for fusion and fission, but also able to form um, flat sheets. And at the kind of the native pressure of these animals that are collected, so around 5,000 kilometers, yeah, yeah, five, five kilometers. At five kilometers under the water, we see a mixture of phases. Um, so they're not just stuck in one, they're still able to access, access both these whole malware sheets and inverted phases. So they're at 500 bar pressure. The biological function and structure of the membranes are essentially preserved. Um, whereas the lipids that don't have their ether bonds, they're just stuck in flat sheets. So they're not going to be able to support biological functions or fission fusion. So it seems like the enrichment of these plasmalogens at high pressure is allowing, potentially allowing the animals to survive and preserve their functions. <clears throat> um, so, sorry. This was just done with synthetic lipids that are, it's just pure PE or pure plasmalogen. Um, I said that we did the same with ex lipid extracts from the actual comb jellies. That's what this plot is showing. Um, so here we have one comb jelly that's essentially just the surface comb jelly. It only lives at the surface. Um, so it, you know, it's not going to be adapted to anything at high pressure. We kind of want to see what happens when we put its membranes at high pressure, what's going to happen to it. And we're comparing this with a comb jelly that's able to go both deep and high. So its membranes hypothetically should be much more dynamic and would enable to accommodate both high pressure and low pressure environments. Um, and so what we see here is that, so on the left is just the surface comb jelly. <clears throat> um, I guess I don't have that analysis, but the comb jellies are essentially when you put them down at high pressure, they're stuck in their little outer sheets, the surface ones. However, the one, the comb jelly that's able to go both deep and to surface, um, it also kind of like what we showed here is at high pressure, it's still able, it's to, its membranes are still in both phases of non lamella and lamella. So it's able to still preserve access to both phases and preserve fission fusion type of thing. Um, finally, and this was my part of the experiments as well. So we, had done, we found last year in 2021, a um, group of scientists identified. A, bio, a very simple biosynthetic pathway for plasmalogens um, in anaerobic bacteria. I was able to get that two gene operon, put it in E. coli, and grow the E. coli under pressure. Um, and that's this left panel A. And essentially, what we found is that the E. coli that just had an empty vector that are unable to make these plasmalogens, when you increase pressure and grow them under pressure, they essentially just are not able to grow as well. But the strains that are able to make plasmalogens, their growth is almost preserved completely. So they're still able to grow fine under pressure. So you know, we do think that just the ability to make plasmalogens in these lipids with ether bonds is in some way helping the organisms grow and survive under high pressure environments. Um, and now we're kind of going in the direction of trying to understand really why that is. 
Um, a second part to this experiment was we also expect, so E. coli are not able to make PC, so they're not able to make the cylindrical lipids, um, but we have engineered the E. coli to be able to make those. And so E. coli that are you know, enriched in just the cylindrical lipids, when you grow them, those under pressure, they essentially die. So the enrichment of cylindrical lipids and less of the conical lipids also seems to be inhibiting their growth and survivability. Um, and that kind of supports the idea that we need these conical lipids to accommodate membrane dynamics in different cases. And if your membranes are just cylindrical and flat, then cells can't really do anything, and they can't survive. <clears throat> um, the next direction of this is kind of going more fundamental is understanding why, what are plasmalogens doing? Why are they important for survival under pressure? And we think that it's for preserving fusion fission events. Um, and that's what we also think is going on in these comb jellies that when you take them from low pressure to high pressure, their cilia become hyperactive. We think that the membrane composition of their synaptic vesicle is, is optimized for function at high pressures. However, when you bring them under, under up to low pressure, <clears throat> they're essentially going to be forming completely different phases and your synaptic vesicles are going to go haywire. Um, so we are collaborating with a few um, people that are doing modeling for us to essentially model what sorts of membranes uh, and membrane phases are being formed at different pressures and conditions to really see what's going on. So wrap this up, these are... Um, the next steps for my work, um, like I said, for understanding adaptations in the tails and fluidity, um, I'd like to see if this SPT23 fluidity sensor is also sensitive to pressure and it's what's acting as kind of this trigger to making more unsaturated lipids under high pressure. Um, for curvature, I have a last one last experiment that I like to do. So it's kind of overexpression and overproduction of these conical lipids. I'd like to see if the overproduction of these essentially results in a gain of function and increased survival better than wild type um, because they are going to have membranes that are able to be more dynamic and fluid, support fission fusion defense. Um, <clears throat> and then for the plasmalogens, we'll, we're this week, we're going to be running experiments where we have vesicles with different plasmalogen ratios and different compositions to essentially see what their fusion rates are with different levels of plasmalogens. And then this is something that we could probably connect um, to more neural synaptic vesicle models. Um, yeah. um, acknowledgements for Gretzins, my lab um, postdocs funding agencies and are collaborating. Thanks for very nice yeah. presentation, Gary. Any questions? Yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, that was really cool. I just wanted to know um, your input on how do you differentiate between the effects of temperature and pressure mm -hmm. when talking about lipids. Um, uh, Coming from the background of like, I know that there are some modifications that happen in the lipid uh, chemistry that organisms use to like accommodate for changes in temperature. So I was wondering, how are you incorporating that into your studies to make sure that the changes that you're seeing are because of pressure? Oh mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So, well, for me it's easy because in my reaction chambers, I can just vary the the pressure and temperature stays the same because I'm growing them in an incubator. However, for the marine biologists, what they've been doing is that because they're able to collect um, animals across different environments and different waters, um, they've been comparing, <clears throat> well, the deep comb jellies, the deep water is also going to be very cold. So they've been running their um, comparisons with comb jellies that are from like Antarctic waters where the water's cold. So temperature variable, it stays constant and the pressure is the only thing that's really Change. Right. And then it also seems to like it's leading to the plasmalogen, like that ether linkage that you have in the lipids. 
as like a potential modification for price yeah. Price. yeah. Something interesting that they've been finding is that there are differences between temperature and pressure adaptation. So plasmalogens, you don't really find them enriched in the just cold water surface level conditions. They're really in the pressure and the low pressure. So that's something I have that should have trying to understand why that is why it's specifically for pressure like that. Respect to what's going on inside the cell, yeah. are there other things that are that you're aware of or the lab is aware of that could be important? Because I'm assuming the pressure changes, the cytoskeleton is changing. Like I think at the symposium we're talking about how mitochondria have like their own linear shape in some cells. Does that change like the organelles and the membrane bound fats in those cells too? Yeah, so proteins are actually less sensitive, much less sensitive to pressure than lipids. Lipids, lipids are the main macromolecule that's most sensitive to pressure. Um, but in terms of biological function, you said for subcellular functions, I don't know if anyone's really looked at those and how those change under pressure. Um, a few weeks ago, I did look at mitochondria from yeast grown under low pressure and high pressure, um, and they look the same, which was kind of pretty surprising. But yeah, kind of, I think what's good to highlight here is that what's being preserved is membrane dynamics, where you're, you're preserving the ability of the membrane to be able to access different phases um, and structures. <clears throat> so it's able to accommodate all the different functions of different organelles. So the cells will tune what lipids are aware accordingly to the membrane function and functions. Um, yeah. I've got uh, two questions. Um, and also, yeah, just amazing talk. Very, uh, felt like I learned a lot. Uh, one, you kind of answered uh, by kind of showing us an, a model organism that kind of goes through high variation, you know, so kind of saying like, this is how a membrane you can adjust to both environments. Are there, any like outliers, I guess, like where you found like at low depth something that's still very like um, I guess like my understanding is it's very well connected and like uh, or like the lower you go, the more kind of like wiggly you get. Mm. I don't think. No, I don't know. But really, that was bad. another question then, I guess, is uh. Were you looking at membrane properties from all parts of the organism or just like specific or like because it's yeast, is it all kind of like um, mixed up together? Um, for the comb jellies, it's easy because they really only have one type of tissue. I think they have all like mineral tissue. Um, for yeast, I am just kind of looking at the global effects of how they grow. I'm not really studying what's going on inside them, but. Um, that was one of the reasons why I looked at the mitochondria to also see if there are these subcellular are there subcellular differences in them. It doesn't seem so. Maybe the cells are preserving those functions. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, just in general for my experiments, I've just been mostly looking at growth and survival. Global effect, not the subcellular small detail details. What kind of computational models are your collaborators doing? Um, I'm not too sure about that. I think we've just kind of recently started working with them, but um, I had a quick question. If you go to the slide that has like JRV measurements or like anything for your uh, cell growth. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, how do you, I guess, my understanding, like, I'm very much a new at growing cells, but I grow so many people lie and take like a colony, and people tell me, like, oh, this colony might be bred in that colony. Like, how do you figure out? You know, like, oh, is it just like the difference in the colonies that like they're growing better or worse, or like how do you um, like figure out that variable? I do all this in biological triplicates. Okay, so I think which helps understand the variability between the colonies that you started cultures.
Any more questions for anyone? No? Well, thanks very much. Thank you. Okay. And a little early today. Everybody, make sure you take some tea home. I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to have to put it back in the fridge. Dr. McCullough, I need to ask you something. Um, Kristen, you and uh, Marcus and uh, Ivan might want to talk about the trip. And um, I think yeah, I yeah. Um, oh, that's right. Okay. And, um, what I'll talk about you. Well, you want to explore what I mean? Oh, thank you. I like it. I'm going to have to put it there. And so, I just go on the chicken. I think the high pressure. The high pressure. Is it jacket? I mean, they go down to the first. Maybe the more large. Large. You've got a one? Or you want one? You already received one? Great job. Oh, that's what you ordered. I'll find out more about it. I'll just finish the question. Yeah. I assume it's the force fields that they launch, right? Yeah. Recognize you with the mask. I swear, every time I see you, your hair is different. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Between the hair and the mask, it's like just a minute. <laughs> so, how are you? I'm doing well. Good. Yeah. Excited you're going on the yeah. Poster. Yeah. So, do you have one? No, I can make one. Okay. Now, let me know when you're looking for it. When should I send that to like? Really yeah, the soon. Okay. Unless your research gonna, is going to change a lot. Oh, uh, not too much. But yeah, I'm going to uh, also try and submit something for the UP <laughs> system wide <laughs> thing. But I might try and do like a talk or something. Because of Wi Fi engineering day at Berkeley or something. So, yeah. Okay. I was just going to say, I was reading, um, I think it was the, uh, the newsletter for the Anchor Tribal. Oh, uh, yeah. 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 I think it was a picture of you all. Don't tell me. Dina? Is it? Or am I saying it wrong? I know what you Okay. What am I saying? How should I say it? That's fine. Like anyone who is a so yeah, it's like, oh, well, that's the first time I've seen that word. So I, I was uh, excited to learn that, excited to learn that you're part of the whole thing. It's yeah, complicated because like we're part of the Navajo Nation now. Right. So like that's kind of like what the Spanish called us like when they were going to the Southwest. Like, so, like, yeah, well, like but our tribes, I guess, like, like there's Dene people up in like Alaska and things like that. And, like, as far as south, that's like where the places are south of the Arctic, supposedly. Like, like, we're kind of like kind of like distinct in our own way now, like being part of the So, nothing about Native American history that wasn't taught me when I was in school and everything, which is, you know, unfortunate. But... There's a lot of it. Oh, man, I can't begin to imagine. There's a whole story from the Pacific Northwest that I heard recently, like where, like, yeah, yeah I don't know. Yeah, I digress. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. I just realized I didn't get those people to sign in before I left. Uh, oh, before yeah. they go. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, so I'll try and get that to you maybe Friday. And yes, but when is like the latest time? Oh, there's no, there's no. The time, you know, as long as it's before the trip. Oh, okay, uh, just make sure that was great. Yeah, yeah. And then what about the uh, details? Are you all good? Uh, uh, we're we're going to uh, find that out and because right now they, you know, they, I don't know if you checked the, the website. They haven't put much on the website. Yeah, yeah. It's like, where are we going? What are we doing? But yeah, we need to, uh, we've gotten approval. 
So okay. that's, that's a good point. I mean, for me, right, myself. Are you going to fly first class? Well, that's okay. Sorry? <laughs> I'm going to fly first class. Well, excuse me. We'll see what we can do. Double check that. Yeah, yeah. I usually miss the flight too, so I need to. Are you one of them? No, I'm 